I've always wanted everywhere I worked to be a place I wanted, enjoyed going to, in addition to making change. And so those two things are really important. And a, a big part of that, because I'm a people person, is the people I work with, do I enjoy working with them? Do we have fun together while also accomplishing some really great stuff? Welcome to All Hands by Lattice, where we believe that people strategy is business strategy. I'm your host, Caitlin Holloway. For the last decade, I've been a people and culture executive at some of the internet's most beloved startups. But my fascination with building true people-first cultures started many, many years ago. From film to tech and a few interesting layovers in between, the one common denominator remains. I am most passionate about enabling people through belonging to create beautiful, innovative products. On all hands, I talk with CEOs and other C-level leaders about how being a people-first company is a strategic advantage. Join us while we chat with these top leaders about how a people-first approach isn't just good for people, it's good for business too. In this episode, we're chatting with the unstoppable Maisha Gatson, CEO and founder of Pearl Long-Term Care Solutions and current Democracy Fellow at the NAACP. Since the day I met Maisha, her center of being has been deeply rooted in advocacy. She has dedicated her career to combating disparities and injustice, ensuring that all people have access to quality health care. She's held seats at some of the most progressive organizations impacting healthcare in our country today, including the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the Black AIDS Institute, Amnesty International, and others. Recently launching her startup, Pearl, Maisha has created a model that solves one of the biggest problems in the senior housing industry, affordable access. Pearl maximizes occupancy through care-driven economical choices, creating mutually beneficial relationships between providers and those seeking care. Named for not just one, but both of her grandmothers, Pearl is the culmination of a beautifully rich and interesting journey for Maisha. Maisha, welcome to All Hands. Thank you for having me, Caitlin. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> this I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. I, I really am grateful for you taking the time to chat with our audience today. So now, Maisha, first question for you. This is going to be a really, really hard one for you. Do you remember the year we met? So that depends. Were you, were you at Claudia Landine before Brookside? No. Nope. So then it was sixth grade. <laughs> oh my God, it was sixth grade. It was sixth grade because we were the first class that ever went to that school. And it started at sixth grade. We were the first graduating class at eighth grade. So yeah, that's when we met. We were what, 11, 12 years old. Uh, tag team was back again. Sisters had voices. Our girl Whitney would always, always love us. We crushed on boys to men and we crushed super hard. But you were my first friend in a new school, in a new life after my parents had just split. Um, I They had gone through a divorce and I had moved into a totally new neighborhood in Stockton. And uh, you were there. You were my best friend. You were also my advocate, which is why this journey and sharing your journey was was so important. You had a huge impact on me and the way that I viewed the world and the way that I learned to view the world um, over those those precious middle school years that are so challenging, so so hard, but but so shaping. I think, and I I, I say this earnestly. I honestly don't know what I would have done without you there, um, a part of my life. And how so how sweet. lovely and emotional. <laughs> I did not put tissues by the computer, <laughs> Caitlin. <laughs> I apologize. I think that one thing that um, was so, even when we were young, that was so present in you was this this notion of just uh, familiarity. Like you were an incredibly warm, uh, you're a people person. And, you know, uh-huh. what better quality to have in a leader than to be someone who deeply is compassionate and cares about people around them. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, on the bike path in, in seventh grade or, you know, flash forward, you know, dang near 25 years later, here we are, right? I was so proud, um, inspired to learn about all of the things that you had done and accomplished since we had seen each other back in high school. And, you know, I think that there was no doubt that you would be the most successful coming out of uh, our little Stockton, California class. Um, You know, really understanding and and hearing from, from your point of view, all of the things that you had done, the work that you had done, the depth of the work that you had done in the healthcare world. It is even further, um, no surprise that you decided to, to go ahead and do something with it. Um, not just go ahead and try to change systems from the inside, but really then go out and create something new. So tell me a little bit about Pearl. Yeah. Pearl, my company was born out of kind of a 
personal pain point. So my grandmother, Pearl Moore, who was my mom's mom, and Caitlin, you mentioned it before, I had two grandmothers named Pearl. Um, So my dad's mom, both of them at the end of their lives suffered from diabetes and both lost their mobility due to diabetes-related complications. And so when my dad's mom lost her mobility, she had just, you know, sold her house in Richmond and bought a new, like, newer house in Susan City. And so it was, had wider hallways and could, you know, easier for it to be outfitted to accommodate her disability. And then we had a family member whose husband was in the service and who had some, you know, minor medical, you know, training that could be her home health care person and, and care for her. And so our, our family was very blessed and lucky to have some, you know, people we trusted that were family members and my grandmother could get the care in the comfort of her home. Fast forward 10 plus years later, my grandmother, Pearl Moore, who, you know, raised me for part of my life. And so I was really close to, to her and my grandfather, uh, Pastor R.D. Moore. They shaped a lot of who I am, my social justice kind of lens. And just really, they were just top-notch Christians and wanted to make a difference in the community. And so they instilled that in me just really early on. And so my grandmother, Pearl Moore, when she got sick at the end of her life and lost her mobility, like complete loss of mobility, her home, um, that's a story in and of itself, but she had stayed in South side of Stockton. For those of you who aren't from Stockton, the South side is uh, where you look to move from, graduate to the North side so you're safe. And so they were beacons of the community and they decided to stay in it and not leave it, even though they could afford a kind of quote unquote more safe environment. And so fast forward to when my grandmother lost her mobility, my grandfather had already passed a few years uh, before. So she's living in the house alone. And we had tried, you know, kind of having family members in there to help, but her house was older. And so we couldn't put in the same kind of, you know, accommodations in her home that could Mm -hmm. help her get around. And she needed pretty much around the clock care. And that became cross cost prohibitive because anytime we're needing someone to give her medical care 24 hours a day, it actually ended up being more expensive than putting her in a facility. So my family turned to me as, um, you know, as a help because of my experience in um, working on Medicare and Medicaid and SCHIP, they knew that I could probably help them, you know, kind of navigate the process. And so I was happy to do so. And it just became very clear um, that the processes that are in place are not really meant to make this easy. And when you're looking to do something in a short turnaround time and, and it's kind of time sensitive, I mean, like, it's just so hard. And at a time when the family's at high stress, and I'm thinking of at the same time that I'm helping my family go through this, I got kind of recruited to work on work implementing the Affordable Care Act. And so it's kind of this weird kind of uh, junction of different things happening in my life where I was just like, huh, if we're making it this easy for people to sign up for healthcare online, then there has to be a better way for families right. in my situation that are looking to help their loved one find long-term care. And so that's when, after that, uh, the idea for Pro Long-Term Care Solutions was born. And I got the balls to do it in 2018. Um, and, and that's a big one. I mean, I had been uh, kind of denying my my entrepreneurial spirit, um, because I felt, particularly after I had my son, I felt, you know, really risk averse. I I felt like I mm-hmm. needed to be in a job, that it was more quote unquote secure, that I needed benefits. I had a child, I needed to be responsible. And so I, yeah. I had left, I had done two years of independent consulting and I had decided to, you know, go back to a traditional job, despite the fact that I liked, I made more money and I liked my independence. And I did it because I was just like, uh, I just got to go. Like, yeah. I can't depend on and grind. I have a baby now. And so it took me the balls until 2018 after having two kids, but having a husband that believed in me and believed in yeah. this concept and said, you have to do this. Like the world needs what you're you're doing. So I was blessed in that regards. And, and so it's been a, a wild ride for these last two years, but uh, yeah. <laughs> good nonetheless. Where are you in the life cycle of the company? Do you have full-time employees yet? Talk to me a little bit about where you are in the, the business life cycle. Sure. Um, So, yeah, we have full time employees. I have my C-suite all set, um, which is it happened like early 2020, like January. And so I have a CTO, I have a COO, a chief of strategy, a chief of business and sales development and a chief marketing officer. And we're looking to bring on some additional um, support on the executive side, as well as some operational support. And we're outsourcing our tech builds. We're working with a company called Velva Tech to do our tech build um, that'll be uh, supervised by our CTO and our COO. Excellent. So how many full-time employees does Pearl have? 
I know, make you do math. Seven. I know, I know. I'm like, wait, I haven't counted lately. Because we're actually in the middle of doing two more hires. So seven now, yeah. but next week that number will be probably closer to 10. Where are you in the actual business life cycle? Is Pearl in market just yet? No, but we uh, plan on being in market with an MVP by the end of 2020. We're actually next week kicking off our tech build uh, and we believe we'll have MP3 within three months and we have some providers lined up for a pilot. So what's important to us is that from the get go, we're building value on both sides for both the long term care providers, as well as the consumers who are looking to find care for themselves or loved ones. Like you said, it starts with culture, not just with once you bring on people, it starts with the kind of the brand you want to build with your company. And I want the Pearl name to be synonymous with quality, ease, transparency, um, that when you come on our site, you, you're not going to be stressed out. We'll be there right along the way with you every step of the way, the way I wanted to be there for my family, the way I wanted to be there for my grandmother. And so we're going to extend the grace of Pearl to you when you join our Pearl family. And then internally, do you also think that the nature of your product being in care, I mean, the word care is in the name of your business. How does that impact or influence your care for your own team? Oh, it influences every piece of it. I've had very many iterations of the team. The team that I have now is the right team. And it took me a while to get there and understand. And it's funny because some people that are on the team now were on previous iterations of the team earlier and came back around. And it didn't matter what team it was. I was always very clear about these are the cultural things I want to put in place for the company. And um, there's nothing, you know, really the same thing, transparency, trust, and ease. Understanding that I'm a mother, I'm a wife before I'm a CEO. Um, I'm also a, f- a full-time student, sit on three boards. I mean, like, like we can go down the list, but I, you know, yeah. balance. <laughs> every, I, I encourage everybody else to have balance that I don't actually give myself, but you know, that that's par for the course for me. Yeah. I said all that to say, I've had about five different iterations of corporate retreats with these different teams. Mm -hmm. And I made it a priority for us to do the cultural stuff versus the like tactical and logistical things first, because for me, you can't even conquer those other things if you haven't set out to uh, create an appropriate and strong culture on how, where there are expectations and how you interact with each other, expectations around how the work is done and kind of graces. I mean, I think I, the team I recruited now, it's like having a team of seven Maishas. We're all type A, go-getter, <laughs> genius people that, you know, like we never stop. Our brains are always like. Yeah. And I have to, I can see my team, like I see their brains working. I'm like, okay, guys, I know I probably don't do this, but like I literally spent 10 minutes in our team meeting right before this saying, I need you guys to really like, don't do anything Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, please. If you email me, yeah. I'm not responding. You know, like, and it's just like, <laughs> you need, <laughs> and I said, I know you're not going to listen, but okay, at least set like maybe just two hours in the morning and then give yourself the rest of the day. And so just yeah. setting those things out in the, and, you know, and also my team is diverse. I have uh, folks that represent the LGBT community, veterans community, I have a few few women, I have a white man, I have a few black men. I mean, like we're all over the board. We check all the boxes. We're actually in the process of getting our 8A certification (laughs) Um, (laughs) for that very reason. And it wasn't, it was intentional, but not intentional Right. in the sense of, you know, I was looking for quality people. I I wasn't looking for them to fit a product like that. It was going to be a black person that was going to fit this role or a white person to fit that role. It was, I want the right person for the right role, um, for mm-hmm. what we're looking to do and what we're looking to bring to the world. And the result of that was a super diverse team and we're all the better because of it. Right now, we're seeing a lot of companies that didn't pay attention to this factor early on. Much of corporate America is now on the defense, trying to make up for years of exclusion. Hiring and nurturing a diverse team doesn't happen overnight. That's why it was so important for Maisha from day one to have a diverse leadership team. Those flywheels will pay dividends as Pearl grows. You know, I think that there's a lot of people that have good intentions, but they have not thought about the impact of their intentions because they don't have people who look like me in the room or people who look like other diverse populations. I actually want to go back a little bit. So, you know, we talked earlier about how growing up, um, you know, you have always been a people person. You have always been very, very people first in your relationships. You know, you were the glue. You were the the party mom. Uh, you were the one making sure everyone had the invite um, and was staying safe and all of those those good things that we needed um, as as children. But I mean, because we were children, let's be clear. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
But to, uh, you know, to, to translate that forward into your leadership style, um, you know, how has being people first really shaped the way you decided you wanted to lead when you, when you, not just when you broke out to be an entrepreneur, but as you have been a manager and a leader um, within different organizations, how has any of that translated to your leadership style? Yeah. You know what? I've been blessed to work on issues and in organizations that I wanted to work for. Um, and so what that meant for me is anytime that changed, <laughs> I was looking to go somewhere else and I knew I'd be employable. But just yeah. to make that answer that more granularly, I've always wanted everywhere I worked to be a place I wanted, enjoyed going to in addition yeah. to making change. And so those two things are really important. And a, a big part of that, because I'm a people person, is the people I work with, do I enjoy working with them? Do we have yeah. fun together while also accomplishing some really great stuff? And so, and and at the point, up until that point, one of those things changed, I stay there. And then I would be like, okay, it's time to go peace out, like next thing, yep. right? <laughs> and so <laughs> I knew coming in, you know, just kind of analyzing my journey up until Pearl that um, not only, it wasn't good enough to just have one or the other. It wasn't good enough to work on an issue that was amazing and be around people who are assholes. Sorry, can I, can I curse? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to be around fan. assholes just because I'm working on a yeah. really good thing, right? Like, and and I also, it's not good to work with people who are just nice but can't get shit done. Like, neither of those two are great. And so I realized coming into Pearl, I needed people who are going to be like execution. Like, execution was number one, but also number one was you being a person I want to be around. And yeah. I, I was hoping that was the what I had built because I was enjoying my team a lot and they were giving me every indication they were enjoying it. You had mentioned that that you maybe had gone through a few different iterations of your your current team. Um, yeah. Were there any learnings in that process for you? What, you know, coming out the other mm -hmm. side, what are some of those um, common denominators or the things that were really salient for you to, to get to this this lovely steady state that you have now? As a startup founder, you're really protective of your ideas. So you tend to go to the people you trust and are closest to you first with your idea and think that that they are the right team for you. Yeah. And so that was my first inclination. And um, it was the wrong one because of the closeness of, you know, those people for various reasons it just didn't work out. Yeah. And it's just really tough to to survive. Like you either are going to survive on the business side yeah. or your friendship's going to survive. And I don't think both make it intact during the really early hard days of a startup. Yeah. And so I commend my friends though, that, you know, I didn't lose any friends in this process because, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, they kind of stepped back on their own. It felt a certain way in the moment, but I understood the decision um, and it was actually the right decision, not only for the friendship, but also on my side for the business side, because I wasn't getting what I needed. And so it ended up being, in most cases, a very mutual decision. And um, and it really that that caused me to learn a lot about myself. Also, not just about myself, but how I'm perceived, because I realized that I realized that like my perception, because, you know, everyone knew that this was so important to me. It was tied to, you know, kind of my me honoring my grandmother's legacy um, mm -hmm. that even when I said, hey, it's OK, like you can wait or whatever, like they just felt pressure and they also just didn't yeah. feel empowered to step into what I needed in that moment. I've given two years in my life. I could have been working for somebody like my career was on the up, like, yeah. and like, why isn't this moving? And, you know, what became clear to me was that God had to move some people out that were not meant to be a part of this. And he had to bring me the right team. And then as soon as I had the right team in place, it's like rocket launch. I would just encourage other founders, if you find yourself in that same place, like just pray about it. I know that sounds really broad, but like, it's not a formal prayer. Like I had a real come to Jesus moment with Jesus. I was like, listen, you said, <laughs> cause I was frustrated. I was frustrated, but he wants us to come, you know, come in that manner of just being honest and open and transparent. And, you know, he was like, okay, okay, daughter, I got you. Like, okay, let me just like make some moves and make it clear to you. And like, here you go. And so like having that breakthrough um, really loosened up a, like just the right resources for us to be in this place right now. And I think if I hadn't gotten to that point, if I hadn't gotten the right people in the right seats and the, the people were in the wrong seats, either in the right seats or out, we mm -hmm. wouldn't um, have the the momentum we have going right now. You know, a lot of what you say 
is true for so many leaders when we're thinking about intentionally building a company. And I think that, you know, if we, if we were to distill it into those basic principles and practices um, that you have found through faith is really about being incredibly thoughtful, right. Yeah. Um, and understanding that, that your, you know, it's not just about a really good idea. It's also about having the right dynamic and the right team that can bring it to life and breathe life into it. And so it, like, I, I always think back to my Pixar days. Um, Ed Catmull uh, was one of our leaders there. And and I remember he he challenged us all the time. He, he would say, what is more important, having the right idea or having the right people? Um, and that's hard coming from a, a studio and, and being in a creative space where, you know, you you do believe that you're, the ideas are everything. What is Toy Story without toys? But you can, ha if you have the right team in place, you know, what is, what is Pearl? How do we bring Pearl to life? Uh, doing it on your own is, is a mountain that is too hard to climb independently. Being able to have not just people, not just bodies to do the work, but having the people who can make it better. The ones who can challenge and say, yes, and like, yep. I love that idea. Let's take that. Let's, let's run it through our values filter. And does this really check the boxes? Are we really serving our customer? Are we really serving these people? Are we, are we leading with care? I know that you lead faith first, uh, but that doesn't mean that people on your team have to lead faith first. Um, right. They lead with their, the same value set. Let's talk a little bit about current affairs. So in, in addition to, to everything else that's going on, we're also currently living through a global pandemic um, that has lasted far longer than I think anyone anticipated. How has the State of the Union impacted your business? How has it impacted your team? How have you had to show up as a leader for your team, um, either from a, a product side or from a, um, a heart side, a human side? Whew. I'll start with the pearl side of like just our business. Before COVID-19, if you had a family member who needed long-term care, like let's say you're looking at three providers, let's use three of the big ones. You Maybe you're looking at Brookdale, maybe you're looking at Sunrise, maybe you're looking at Genesis. You would have to go to each of those facilities, fill out their paperwork, um, go on their tours, uh, check to see if, go have their care level assessment done at each of those facilities. And that's before you even really might even know whether they can meet your loved one's needs, whether their uh, services were in your family's budget, just all these different yeah. things. So it's very time consuming, very manual. So then hit COVID-19 and senior housing facilities become the kind of epicenter pretty quickly of how these cases are, you know, kind of growing. Right. So many of these facilities just like close their doors to outside visitors. What that also meant is they close their doors to new residents and their occupancies sharply declined and their revenues as a result also sharply declined. It kind of created this like perfect storm of where like everything we were already planning to do in terms of just making it seamless. Like if you don't want to talk to a human, you don't have to through this whole process yeah. until you like actually move, move in your loved one. But if you do in any place, uh, you know, along the way, we're also here for you. So that was one piece of it. Now, later on, you know, COVID-19 and then, you know, George Floyd's death and, you know, kind of Black Lives Matter and this larger conversation around equity and justice. And and you're talking to a freedom fighter who read Roots in the fifth grade and has been a member of the NAACP <laughs> like most of my life served, you know, like. And so yeah. I'm sitting here like reading the tea leaves and being like, oh, my gosh, like, you know, we've had these windows open before. Right. Like every, you know, when Philando Castile happened, when Sandra Bland happened, when, you know, Trayvon Martin happened yeah. and it was a window, but it closed pretty quickly and it closed yep. in a way that I don't think we were able to truly have the, the real conversation, which yes. I am hopeful. I, I think this time feels different. As Maisha and I were chatting, she started telling me about an incident that happened to her on Juneteenth. Her family was about to go on vacation, and the night before she went to a big box retailer to get some last minute things for their rental. She ended up with multiple baskets of things, kids toys, bed sheets, air mattresses, you name it. But it was getting late. The store was about to close and sales associates were still ringing her up and helping her get a few items on her list. And all of a sudden, this manager goes over the PA and she goes to the one customer that's left in the store. The store closed at 830. You need to either leave the store or check out. You need to leave now. The store closed at 830. We have what? contractors here. Yes, the sh she's blasting me, like just me. <laughs> we have contractors here that have been here since 830 and they can't start as long as you're in the store. And so I get to the front 
And I'm like, there's a another man, like an assistant manager. And I'm like, well, who just made that made that announcement? Because I don't like to spend money anywhere where I'm not treated with dignity and respect. And despite the yeah. fact that I've probably amassed, you know, like two thousand dollars worth of things and I won't be able to right. get it from anywhere else, I'm more than happy to walk away from this cart if I can't talk to this person and they don't issue an apology. And so the manager comes out and the whole time she's walking up, we closed at 830. We closed at 830. We closed at 830 because she hears me talking to the other person. And I'm just like, I couldn't see where she was coming from. So I didn't know like who it was. And much to my chagrin, it was a black woman who was the manager. And I say, you know, hey, so I'm just trying to get this stuff. You know, I had the person who was ringing me up was still ringing me up when I went to get this. And she said it was okay for me to go. And she was like, well, we have contractors coming and da, da, da. And I was like, ma'am, I understand. I said, however, I don't appreciate how you spoke to me on the intercom and how you're speaking to me now as a paying customer. And so she goes, well, I apologize, but I'm going to get the cops to escort you out. Oh, mm. yeah. Uh, and I said, I said, sis, really on Juneteenth, you, a black woman, store manager of this this store, is going to call the cops on another black woman just because I'm trying to buy stuff from your store. She was already wow. gone out the door, already gone out the door. And so long story short, the cops did not come in. They, they realized that Good. she was just completely irrational. I'm just lucky, like, that the cops didn't come in and, like, yeah. escalate and nothing happened. My kids were in the car when this happened, watching yeah. a movie on the DVD player, right? And so I'm sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, this could, I can't believe this is happening right now. And so I, I got my stuff, I checked out and it was just all the staff and and most of them were white. They just were like hanging their heads and like shaking their heads yeah. and shaking. I can't believe this happened. And um, the cashier, she kind of, she walked me out to help me because I had two baskets. Mm-hmm. And um and she basically was like, you know, I'm so sorry you had to go through that. So basically, I, you know, my team and I, we talked about the incident and I was just like, this is such a tone deaf thing to happen. Corporation mm-hmm. to corporation. And this was right after that. Earlier in that day, we had issued a press release that Pearl was making Juneteenth a holiday and that we were calling mm-hmm. on all U.S. corporations, all states, the federal government and all U.S. based VC firms to make Juneteenth a holiday. And so then this happens and I'm like, okay, I think we should maybe put this out. Like what just (laughs) happened? Because it really just speaks Mm -hmm. to the the moment and then the the kind of the sensitivities that we need to take. And my whole thing was, I'm going to make sure that this company knows about it. I'm also going to like make sure that the the circumstances, like the story minus the company's name is out there because there's Mm -hmm. some change that needs to happen in multiple ways. And my C, my chief strategy officer made a really astute point. He said, the the narrative is not just you know kind of black lives matter don't call the the police on on black people but it's really a business imperative like right mm-hmm. first you need to create an environment where your leaders feel empowered to to provide a level of customer service to customers no matter what because he was like yeah. i'm sure as a manager she's worked her way up to get this job and she's going to be the decision she made to be rude to you was I need to get this, this customer out because I'm going to hear it from corporate because I have these, these contractors were on the right, right, right. Right. (laughs) So she was rude to me for that, but it should never be a dichotomous situation. You should know that if you're helping a customer, that corporate will have your back because having that customer be there is that important to them. And so it becomes a business decision, not a color decision. And then take the other lens of like, depending on your brand, any number of your customers look like me, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and so then even if you're just saying at a high level, custom, all customers should be treated with dignity and respect. And oh, by the way, a good portion of those customers are going to be black and brown. And if you escalate these situations, like you're perpetuating uh, something that'll be bad for our brand and bad for our business. So then it becomes mm-hmm. a conversation, not just about race, but it's a business conversation. And And if you can't, monetize on a biz on a business deal because of your the impact that your uh kind of leadership practices are creating then we have a problem and i think we see this in so many different industries and so i wanted to yeah. create a broader conversation around that so you know now it's like pearl meets social justice <laughs> i i think that that's so salient i mean there's 
there was a slow movement in, you know, just the employer branding uh, world prior to, to, we'll just call it 2020. Um, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> I know. And, and the, the, the weight that that bears, but you know, there, there was this movement from an employer branding standpoint where companies um, can no longer not take a moral stance on, on issues, on things. It's, it's a moral imperative to show up and, and do the right thing. Um, because otherwise you will limit your ability to hire top talent. You will limit your ability to attract customers. And, you know, the, the business case for diversity, equity, and inclusion has, has been around, but I think that this really, you know, the, the, the kind of confluence of events has really, put us in a position to face it head on. And I think that as founders and as business leaders uh, to embrace that, to truly embrace that um, is, is what is necessary now and is honestly what will, will help us make change and not in small strides uh, in this next chapter, um, you know, in the post 2020 world, whatever that may look like. I know. All right. Rapid fire. I'm going to hit you with these questions and I want you to answer them as quickly as possible. Don't overthink it. Are you ready? Yeah. (laughs) Okay, good. (laughs) First question. Total segue. Is a hot dog a sandwich? No. You almost thought about it. I appreciate that you didn't. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) I was like, a sandwich is this way. A hot dog. No. (laughs) Zoom or phone call? Zoom. Best brandy song of all time. Ooh. Oh, you got me. Oh, 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 that's okay. I'm just going to go with, I want to be down. Yeah. You know, with the hand movements. Yep. You know, I do. I wish we were on video because I'm doing them totally. (laughs) But she has so much. I love Brandy. She's one of my favorites. Oh my gosh. Okay. (laughs) Okay. That was the warm up. I have a lot. The last few questions here won't be so easy. Company culture, family, or sports team? Oh my, whoa. <laughs> I told you they wouldn't be easy. Um, you thought Brandy was hard. So I'm going to go ahead and say family because my my company and my family are intertwined. So I, that's kind of an, I'm, I get to cheat on that one. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's fair. It's fair. Yeah. Next question. How do you know when you have the right people assembled to build something? It's not painful. Hmm. Love that answer. It doesn't hurt. I love it. Well, uh, last question um, of the the rapid fire actually relates. When was the last time you wanted something so badly it hurt? Every day of my life. (laughs) You are a very deep feeler. A very deep feeler. Yeah. Yeah. It it shifts, but every day of my life, something. I believe that. I do believe yeah. that you you are a deeply empathetic, uh, compassionate person who who has a lot of drive. So that, that that actually doesn't surprise me at all. Something I actually really appreciate about you. And okay, so in conclusion, one final question, Maisha: What advice would you give to founders and people leaders out there trying to make sense of this moment in history? How can they use this opportunity to build a better organization in this next chapter? Yeah, I think um, one is the, the the main question or the word is try, right? Just do the best you can, marshal your resources. We are all here at such a time as this. It's not an accident that we are in the positions or the seats that we're in right now in this moment. So use whatever your seat is to make the positive change that you want to make. And you'll see it fall into place. I think when Pearl started really having the success is when I let go of the outcome. When I said, Mm -hmm. okay, maybe God's going to bless me, bless Pearl through some avenue that is not Pearl. And I just need to let go of the outcome. I was holding so tightly onto it. I think when you just look around and just try to be the the person and do the things that you want to come back to you. I used to be so tightly held wed on the give unto others as, or do unto others as you want them to do unto you. I had a one-to-one ratio. So it's like, if I was nice to Caitlin, mm-hmm. I expected Caitlin to be nice to me. When I let that go, it's like, I'm just putting mm-hmm. out positivity in the universe and I don't need it to come back to me from the person I gave it to, but I know it's going to come back to me in some way, shape, form, or fashion, whether it's personally, whether it's for my family, whether it's for my business. And when I tell you, when I let go of those two things, my world flipped upside down and revved up more than I can catch up with it. And I think if all of us were to do those things and just do and and remember love and grace that we get so much farther and so much faster together. 
Oh, I love that. I I agree wholeheartedly. I think now is the time to be open and redefine and reprioritize all of the things that we thought were precious. Um, yeah. That this really has been a moment where we can step back and and think very very long and hard about how we want to move forward. So I I am so grateful for you being on the show. I'm so grateful for you sharing your stories, um, and I very much look forward to the next time we can catch up. But thank you Absolutely. so much, Mike. Thanks so much for having me. This was so so great. And to you, the listener, thank you so much for joining me on this week's episode of All Hands, brought to you by Lattice. I'm your host, Caitlin Holloway. This episode was produced by Pod People, Rachel King, Eliza Lambert, and Samantha Gatsik. Special thanks to Annette Cardwell. Learn more about how Lattice can help your business stay people-focused at Lattice.com or find us on Twitter at LatticeHQ. Don't forget to subscribe to All Hands wherever you get your podcasts. Join us next time.